And uh, so some of what we're going to be doing is we're going to re be repainting uh, the railings out here, but they'll be in the shade. The breeze starts really to blow about three, right? And so by then it'll be cooling off and everything, so it'll be nice. But uh, uh, we'll be doing various different things on um, on uh, Saturday evening, if you can make it. And are, are people showing, even if it's raining, we're going to have things to do? Yes. So Bob has things for us to do no matter what. <laughs> and so even if it's raining, which is uh, interesting, we got a tropical storm out in the Gulf. Or uh, we have a depression, and then we have a tropical storm developing. So it's not exciting for hurricane season, but for surfers, you get really excited. <laughs> you know, so. But uh, anyways... And uh, my wife informed me I have white stuff all over my black shorts. And if you noticed, I'm sorry. Uh, right before service, I had a few minutes, so I ran in, and I have a surfboard that I've been repairing in one of the rooms over here. And I sanded it down, and I went, and I'm like, oh, no, it's not coming off. So it's just fiberglass, no big deal. <laughs> so sorry about that. So our wives take care of us in that way. You got stuff all over you. Don't leave the house. Change your shirt. <laughs> Anyways. We are in Nehemiah, and we'll be giving you an introduction and, and uh, going through chapter 1 tonight. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we uh, again just come before you and just ask you to bless uh, us as we look at just the principles of these narratives, this history that we've been looking at, and just seeing your radical provision, your promises being fulfilled for the Jews, um, and even seeing their faithlessness, God, but your faithfulness to continue to reach out to them and draw them back to yourself, God. That is amazing. And so as we travel through Nehemiah, Lord, help us just to see your glory in it, your message in every chapter for us, Lord, to be able to absorb and just understand you in a greater way and fall more in love with you ultimately, God. So we love you, and we just ask that your Holy Spirit dwell with us, God. We pray for those that are sick, Lord, and those that have been sick, and just pray for full recovery, God. We, we do pray for an end to this, but even if not, God, we're going we're gonna to stand in the fire, and we know that you're present with us, God. And... Uh, that your church is quite capable of overcoming anything this world throws at it, God. So for that, we're thankful as well. But we always need your blessing to make it. We can't do it on, on our own, so we just ask for your presence again to be here in a tangible way, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so again, Nehemiah picks up where the book of Ezra ends. Now, what is happening is the Jews are returning from their punishment. They've been being punished by being in exile for at least 70 years. Some were there for well over 80 years. People like Daniel never got back, we, we, we know. And so some were there for a shorter time because the wave of taking them away was uh, threefold. And then the waves of bringing them back were, was also threefold as we're going to see. And so, uh, but the Lord had promised, you're going to be out of the land for at least 70 years. The bulk of you will be out of the land. Why? Because you fell into idolatry, right? And so, uh, God wants to bless them. They go against God's plans. God warns them, warns them, warns them. They keep on going down that road, and God has to punish them in order, because he loves them, not because he hates them. And so then they, they come back from the captivity in a miraculous way. Now, the first return, as we learned from the book of Ezra, came under the leadership of a man named Zerubbabel, and 50,000 people came back to Jerusalem with him. There were millions that were in exile, but 50,000 came back with him. He was a political leader, and his main goal or focus was to restore the place of worship, to bind the people together, to rebuild the temple of God, which was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And he came back, and he laid the foundation of the temple in 536 B.C. But there was great opposition that we read about, and they got discouraged. And for 15 to 16 years, they didn't work on the temple at all, but eventually, 20 year, 21 years after it was initially started, it was actually completed. And that was chapters 1 through 6 of the book of Ezra. 
Now, the book of Ezra, the first part could have been named the book of Zerubbabel, right? But it was named the book of Ezra. Ezra doesn't show up in the first six chapters because Ezra shows up on the scene leading 2,000 people, mostly priests and those that would serve in the temple, back from Babylon 80 years after the beginning of the first return. 80 years. And so he shows up in the back half of the book of Ezra. So the first one was Zerubbabel. He came as a political leader, but Ezra came as a priest. Now, they had rebuilt the temple, but just having a place to meet doesn't build the church up. you got to have the substance behind it. You know, the old saying, build it and they will come. Well, they might come, but what are they doing there, <laughs> right? And so this is why Ezra was so important. He wanted spiritual restoration. And what had happened was the Jews had started intermarrying with the peoples around them, which wouldn't have been the problem if the people around them had actually become Jews and, and received the true and living God into their life as a form of worship. But what they did is they intermarried and they started to fall away into the gods of the pagans that were around them. They were falling into the same trap once again. And so they had to repent, and we, we talked about that. Now, on the scene is this man, Nehemiah. Now, understand that Nehemiah is a contemporary with Ezra. They're both there together, okay? Also with, with prophets like Malachi. And so this is the very end of the Bible story. When we get to the end of Nehemiah, it's the end of the Bible story of the Old Testament until John the Baptist shows up on the scene as far as the scriptures go. Uh, we, we don't know of any official prophets and certainly not prophets that God felt would write scripture. Remember, Old Testament prophets were God's word. They were the scripture. And uh, so... So this is at the very end of the, the nation of Israel prior to that 460 years of silence before John the Baptist shows up on the scene and introduces Jesus. And so you had laying the foundation and building the temple, and then you had the restoration of actual temple worship and spirituality, and then you have this man, Nehemiah, and his primary focus is going to be to rebuild the walls of the city. Why? Well, in those days, if you didn't have walls to the city, you were absolutely defenseless and your city was looked upon as just a village because you can just be overrun at any given time. And so this is about 10 years after Ezra shows up, Zerubbabel shows up to rebuild the walls. Again, Jerusalem was meant to be a place that drew the attention of the world so that they would come into contact with Jehovah, Yahweh, with God. And they could come to know him. They could visit during the, during the feast and they, they would see the glory of God and they would come to salvation. Jerusalem was meant to be a shining light for the world to get to know God. That's why they had outer courts known as the court of the Gentiles. They wanted people to see the worship of of God. And so for Jerusalem just to have walls that were broken down and just to look like, like a city that, that, that was no longer a city, a city of past, was, was a dishonor to the Lord. But understand, what the walls were to Jerusalem, there is a spiritual application to our lives before God. We need rebuilding in our lives continually. Why? Well, the world is vexing, isn't it? Doesn't the world take shots at our lives and we, we just get beat up after a while and we need to continually maintain those walls and, and, and build up those, those defenses and, and, and strengthen ourselves in the Lord? We need to do that. And people say, oh, you know, I became a Christian. I'm good. Now, men, tell that to your wife. You know, eh, I married you. We're good. We don't need to talk anymore. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, does it, right? It's a relationship that needs to be built up and strengthened over time, right? And, and if we let those walls down, if we let the world in, it just pillages us. It rips us off. It breaks us down. And we're in ruins to the point where people may not even recognize you as a Christian. I was a leader in my high school group. Six years or Four or five years into college, I had people witnessing to me in, in the school commons area. <laughs> and I'm like, why are you witnessing to me? Well, they're witnessing to me because they're, they didn't recognize me as a Christian at all. 
I, I, I had been ruined by the world. I'd let the world in and break down those defenses and, and trash what God had built up in me. And, uh, and it doesn't happen all of a sudden. You know, this, this, this city has been broken down for a long time, and it just got worse and worse over time. And that's what happens in our life. You know, a few weeds, you know, come up, and then a tree comes up, and then the, the sidewalk's just broken to pieces, right? You don't maintain it. And, it, and it happens over time. And then you have no defenses. And so, for us, we are built up in the Lord. We resist evil, how? By being strong in the Lord, by having hedges of protection in our lives. Now, again, as the book of Nehemiah closes, this will be the end of the, uh, the history that we have as far as the scriptures for the nation of Israel prior to John the Baptist. Now, the first seven chapters of Nehemiah deal with the rebuilding of the walls of the city. And then chapters 8 through 13 focus on revival once again. Well, didn't Ezra do that? Yeah, but does he have to do it again? Yeah. <laughs> Revival. <laughs> Relife, right? That's what that word means, relifing us. And we pray for revival. We want life in the church. And so it's common amongst the Jews. It's also common amongst us that we need that revival. So Ezra is very involved in chapters 8 through 13. Now, again, the people returned to Jerusalem, 50,000 under Zerubbabel, rebuilding the temple. 2,000 returned with Ezra 80 years later to rebuild the people. And then Nehemiah leads 14 years later, to, or 10 to 14, 10 to 12 years later to rebuild the wall. Now, it can be broken up as intro into the first six chapters, the, the construction of the wall around Jerusalem, and again, the restoration of the people. Now, as far as Nehemiah himself, he is an interesting character. We know, I, you know, as we went through Ezra, it was amazing to find out how important Ezra was to the Jews and how many books he actually wrote of the Old Testament and how, how, uh, how integral he was to the the carrying on of the faith of the nation because he was the one that actually had set up synagogues everywhere that there was at least 10 Jewish males. A synagogue would be built and they would meet at least once a week, something we still do today, right? And so we, we, it was interesting. But Nehemiah himself, it's, it's amazing because you have Zerubbabel, who's a politician. You have uh, Ezra, who's a, who's a priest. He's in the line of, of Aaron, so he's a Levite, also of the family of Aaron. And, and he's a pretty incredible guy. But then you have Nehemiah. What's Nehemiah? Nothing special to begin with. Except for his character was so good, like Daniel's, that he had gained the trust of a pagan king. He was a faithful man. And he worked his way up. He doesn't have any pedigree. But we know that he was a cupbearer for the king. We'll talk about that in a minute. He was a foreman to rebuild a wall, and eventually he becomes the governor over Jerusalem. Because he had a heart for God, God was able to work with him. Now, also, the name Nehemiah is very prophetic. It means the Lord is comfort. So he's going to get the people to look to the only one who can truly give them comfort in the dangerous times they were living in. History tells us they were being attacked from the people continually. And, and, and it was just vexing on them that, that they didn't have the protection that they desired. But he wanted to bring them comfort. Second Corinthians 1, 3 through 4 says, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. That's a pretty heavy statement, right? The God of all comfort. Who comforts us in all our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. It's a gift that keeps on giving. As you're comforted, you're able to comfort others. So he will lead and comfort the people as they see that their strength is not found in the world, but in the Lord. 
Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. It came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Who's on the throne? Well, it's Artaxerxes in 1465. The 20th, or he took the throne in, in 1465. The 20th year of his reign will be 1445. Which is, and, and in this certain month, he's writing. This is when uh, he's, he's giving us his testimony. It's in November or December. In Shushan or Susa, it's their winter palace. It basically becomes the winter capital there in the Persian Empire. And this man, Hananiah, he calls him his brother, and he's actually his brother. We learned from chapter 7. And so he asks them, how are they doing and how is the city? Verse 3, and they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captiv captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So how are they doing? And their response was simple. They're not doing so well. Jerusalem, again, without protection, is a picture of a life that has lost its defenses against attacks and lies open to repeated hurt and misery. And... Uh, I so often see it, you know, you, you have someone that's a young person gets disappointed with God because they had expectations that weren't God's expectations, right? We always project these things that God should do. And if he doesn't do them, sometimes we get disappointed. Oh, I'm going to do it my own way. And where does that lead? It just leads to misery on top of misery. It continually does. If you do it your own way, you're just digging deeper into that hole of misery. And... Um, so again, the people are not spiritually strong, and they're not really being physically strong, and they're not trusting in the Lord. And so God loves them enough to send Nehemiah. But here, God is just getting his heart ready to do a great thing through him. So Nehemiah responds, Nehemiah responds this way in verse 4. It says, So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept. Wept, and I mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, it is interesting. This man that worked so close to the king could have been overwhelmed by all the grandeur that he saw and thought he was somebody and built himself up, right? I came from nothing, and now I'm at the king's side. But he kept humble. He remained humble. He had a heart for God. Why do we know this? Well, immediately he goes into prayer. There's a need, and he goes into prayer. Understand that we find him in this book praying 10 times. What don't you find so often through the book of Kings, even through the book of Judges? Very often, people aren't praying, are they? And they just, they're being led down a road that's just confusing and dumb and stupid, and they're just, you know, it's like foolish. The books are full of crazy stories because men don't pray. But here... Recorded, we see Nehemiah praying 10 times in this book. It opens with prayer and it closes with prayer. This book does. And his heart is broken for the people. He prays during the day, he prays at night. It's natural for him to pray. You know, it was pointed out as I was preparing this study, it was pointed out, when you're on your knees, you can't knock your knees. When you're on your knees, you're normally not in fear. Because you're before God, who loves you, who can bring that comfort. So get on your knees and then try knocking your knees. You can't do it. <laughs> but I think spiritually that's also true. But he's distressed. And it's interesting because he's distressed over Jerusalem. Most likely never been there. He has to go wherever the king goes. We, we don't believe that this particular king ever visited there. But the Lord put a burden on his heart that was supernatural. You know, there is such a balance between the word of God and the Lord laying things upon our heart because he's a living God and we have a relationship with him. 
but he is one God. And so if he's laying something on your heart, it agrees with what's in the scriptures as well, <laughs> right? A lot of people try to pass things off that are just crazy as prophecy from God, but in all reality, the principle isn't there in the scripture. And you can immediately just go, no. New Testament says, test all things and hold on to that which is true. But his heart is broken for Jerusalem and God is doing something. God moves people's hearts. It is interesting that even today, for decades now, Jews are still moving back to Israel from all over the world. They have a passion for a place that they've never been. For a while, Calvary chapels were actually gathering a lot of um, money to, to give to ministries because so many Russian Jews were just showing up without anything in Israel. And it just opened up the crack of the door to be able to love on them with Christ's love and introduce them to their own Messiah, their Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so the Lord is able to lay supernatural things on, or burdens on our heart. And don't dismiss those things. Pray about those things. God, what are you doing? I'm always excited when new people show up. It's like, okay, what, what's God going to do through you? What's, what's your passion? You know, how, how are you going to flavor this body? It isn't a five-point plan from the pastor. It's like, no, we're a body. We function together to see what God wants to do through us. And so he lays this on Nehemiah's heart. Verse 5, And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night for the children of Israel, for your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted corruptly, very corruptly against you, and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the furthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them into the place which I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name." Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. Let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. And so he prays fervently over this situation. He recognizes the reasons for their problems. Their problems stem directly because they have turned from God. Now, sometimes our problems are just natural problems that people face. Sometimes our problems come because we just disobey God, right? <laughs> and, and, and this is so true. For them, they absolutely disobey God. They have turned from God primarily. And he confesses that they deserve what they've gotten. And he includes himself with those that have transgressed the law. And it's awesome to see the great leaders in the scriptures. People like Ezra also identified. People like Isaiah also identified with the sins of the people. But in all their wickedness, Nehemiah reminds God of what he promised them. <laughs> but this is what you said. And we're returning. So I'm holding you to your words which may seem bold, other than the fact that God did promise that, didn't he? And so many didn't listen, and God was upset when people didn't hold on to his promises and trust that he was faithful. And so this is an act of faith, and God shines upon great acts of faith. Instead of shutting them out, it's like, what are you talking about? Why are you using that against me? He's praying, right, Lord, you said, and I'm standing on your promise. If they turn back, he will forgive them and restore them. And so he's reaffirming the faithfulness of God, and God loves it when you trust in his faithfulness. 
Oops, what did I do? Sorry. There's a button that turns off the screen right below the button that advances the screen. Bad design, sorry. <laughs> Anyways, as hopeless as this situation may have looked, Nehemiah trusted in the words of God. So again, how did he do this? He quotes scripture back to God. It's wonderful to pray with the word of God on your lap and open. And if you say, well, I don't know what to pray. Well, open up your Bible. Open up your Bible and start praying what the Bible says. He knew that through God's word, he knew that God, through God's word, was faithful. Therefore, he was able to fully rest upon the faithfulness of God. So he knew God's character. He knew him by reading the stories of old, by reading the testimonies, by reading the Pentateuch. He knew God, and therefore he trusted God. And even though things looked helpless, he knew that God could just as easily turn things around. He knew what happened in the judges when they turned their heart back towards God. He knew what happened during the time of the kings when they turned their heart back towards God. Jeremiah 32, 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth. By your great power and outstretched arm, there is nothing too hard for you. Again, this is something we need to remember. If God is God, if you start off with God and you look at miracles, miracles are nothing. <laughs> They're easy. If you start off with miracles, they get a little weird, and then you've got to try to figure out God through the miracles. No, God is above the miracles. And so he trusts God radically. So, again, in verse 7 there, it says, We have acted very corruptly against you. We've damaged you, it would mean in the Hebrew. We wounded you. We caused you pain. We caused you hurt. And so he's not just saying, Well, you know, we kind of went our way, own way. He's saying, we know that you love us so much that our disobedience breaks your heart, God. And he identifies with it. Many people might want to correct Nehemiah. No, Nehemiah, you're doing good, but those other people. But he realizes. He, he's, he's manning up. He's saying it's okay. And then he says, grant him. At the very end there what does he say he says in verse what verse is it he says in verse 11 he says grant him mercy in the sight of this man so he's talking to god then he's talking about himself third person right grant him mercy in the sight of the king lord grant me nehemiah mercy in the sight of Artaxerxes is what he's saying for i was the king's cupbearer Now understand, he's praying a dangerous prayer. Because sometimes you can pray, oh Lord, be with the president and those in the halls of Congress. And we need to pray that. But when you pray, Lord, I pray for my neighbor that they might be saved. Which one's more dangerous for your comfort zone? <laughs> right? Because God might ask you to actually fulfill that very thing which you're praying for, right? It's kind of easy to pray for those things that are far off that you can't even imagine yourself. But when you start praying for your friends, when you start praying for your family members, when you, God wants to use you in that situation. So those are scary prayers, right? And Nehemiah is saying, I am seeking to do something about this. This radical prayer that I'm praying, Lord, I want you to use me in the middle of it. So he is manning up. A praying Christian is more often than not an active, obedient Christian. Remember Isaiah, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I, then I said, here, I, here am I, send me. I want to be on the front lines. I don't want to just watch it. And I always remind people because for me it just makes so much sense. 
that those that were sweating and serving behind the scenes at the wedding feast where Jesus turned the water to wine were the ones that got to see the miracle take place, right? The servants are the ones that are on the front line that get to watch God move. And I tell you what, people in prayer meetings get to watch God move too. Start with the prayer meetings, but allow those prayer meetings to, to get you to move as well. Here I am, send me. So then Nehemiah mentions that he was a cupbearer to the king. What does this mean? Well, Herodotus, the Greek historian, says the Persians, which were the leaders, this is Artaxerxes, bestowed great honor on the cupbearers, often making them chief administrators over their staff. So besides merely tasting their food and drink to make sure the king wasn't going to be poisoned, if you had someone like that around you that you trusted so much with that one thing, you would be willing to trust them with more, wouldn't you? Because they are actually putting their life on the line daily for you. And if they continue to be willing to do so, you're going to trust that person greatly. And obviously, he would accompany the king at every meal, every state gathering, every political trip that the king would take. Who would be there with him? Nehemiah was with the king all the time. But yet we shall see he is still a very humble man. And the fact that he immediately prays humility. It's not like, oh, I got this, God. I know the king. We're tight, right? But he sees it as a gift. He says, I might be the answer to this prayer. We need to see our position, our place in life as a gift instead of hate it or want to be someone else. What does God want to do through me in my particular role, whatever it might be? Remember Esther was faced with a similar situation. Her position was a gift from the Lord to rescue his people. Obviously, incredibly beautiful girl, right? Striking where she could attract the attention of this king that had a harem. And, and was she supposed to use that beauty to manipulate and get things out of the world and to make money? Or was she to use that for God's glory? So whatever it is, you give it unto the Lord. Remember, in that verse at the very end, it says, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. She was chosen for such a time as this. And it's interesting how certain people were so important a few months ago, and now all of a sudden they're kind of by the wayside. And we thought, well, these people will never go away. And now they're like, ooh, wait a second. Airline pilots, when they cancel all of, the, <laughs> all of the flights, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, wait a second, what's the deal with this? People who manage resort hotels across the world, what happened to them? Right? You know, it's, and, and sometimes you just like, what in the world is important and what isn't important? Listen, whatever is important is where God places you. And that's what makes you valuable. That's what makes you important. You know, the reason diamonds are valuable because people are, are willing to pay for them. Why aren't marbles valuable? Because they're just not. They're just round pieces of glass. They're common, right? They're no big deal. But whatever someone is willing to pay for something, that's its value. So the thing is, I realize without the Lord in my life, I don't have value. Because I'm just like anybody else. I'm just one of seven and a half billion people on this earth, in a history of people that have lived and died on this earth for thousands and thousands of years. And I live in Corpus Christi. And I have a funny name and no middle name. And I'm one of, you know, six kids, and I'm number five out of six kids. So I'm the little brother, the despised one. <laughs> you know, or whatever. I'm not the despised one, but... <laughs> Anyways, you know, it's like, what am I really without the love of God? But you know what? God loves me. He was willing to pay for me. You know what? I know I'm valuable. I am valuable so are you. If you're a believer, you are valuable. Why? The creator of the universe, the king over everything, the sovereign, the sustainer, the one that everything was made for, died for you and knows your name. Right? We, we have that, we have that, that incredible 
value. And, and, and so Nehemiah knew who he was in the Lord. And he's saying, Lord, please help me with my boss. Instead of going, oh, I'm the cupbearer. I got some standing here. He's like, no, use it. Use it for your glory. And so sometimes God steps in in miraculous ways, but most of the time he likes to use ordinary human beings. Consider Gideon. We always look at Gideon, the judge. It's this incredible figure, you know, that wiped out the Midianites. Gideon was so afraid that God had to, to encourage him five or six different times to go fight because he was afraid. You know, I'll just put out this fleece. I already said with my words what you're supposed to do. I'll just put out this fleece. The fleece does what it's supposed to do. And he's like, okay, well, I'll just turn it over and do it again. <laughs> you know, and then he has to, you know, have this vision. And then he has to have a test run with his father's idols. And it just goes on and on and on. God uses ordinary men. And he, and he can use you. But again, this man started somewhere, didn't he? He started somewhere, and then eventually he showed himself so trustworthy that he ended up being the king's right hand. But he never forgot where he came from. And to be used by God is a wonderful thing. Who would not want to be used by God? No, I would guess most in this room would say, yeah, I want to be used by God. But actually, there's a lot of Christians out there that are like, I'm going to duck my head because I know sometimes God calls people to the mission field. And I don't want to do that. Or maybe God will tell me to give more money away to a missionary or some mission downtown or maybe to a church building project. Just, I don't want to do that. Maybe God will even get me to go to a Saturday evening church work day. I don't want to do that. <laughs> maybe serve in the children's ministry. God forbid. Maybe the junior high ministry, God forbid, forbid, right? You know, whatever, you know, it's like, whatever it might be, we're, we're, we're like, but when you get over this hump where God becomes your everything, you're like, here I am, God, use me, right? And there's, there's a switch that takes place in your life. It's like, you're preserving your life or, or, or you're giving your life away. And incredible satisfaction comes when you're willing to give your life away, you know, Fab and I were just talking about it before service. There's some people that will never apologize because they're holding on to their pride. Never apologize. Ever. But once you're comfortable with who you are, you realize, man, I can hurt people's feelings. I can apologize. Right? Like, and then it's done. But if you never apologize, you got all this conflict all around you all the time, right? And you're always defending yourself. But it's so, so much better to do it God's way. But our flesh doesn't want to do it God's way. But once you do, it's like, oh, what a relief. So to be used by God is glorious. Who won't want to be used by God? But what does it do? You move out of your comfort zone when you're used by God, don't you? Aren't you? You're moved out of your comfort zone. Very often, it takes personal sacrifice. So he was not merely content to get answers to prayer. He wanted to be the answer to prayer. Lord, I'm praying for this, and I want to, I want to be involved in it. Right? I want to be on the front lines. Because understand, Nehemiah, throughout this book, is about to give up a life as a wealthy official, radical respect, and knowledge. In one of the wealthiest cities of the day, and purportedly one of the most beautiful places of the day, working with the most powerful man on earth as his right-hand man in that day, to go build a wall in a city that has been in ruins for 100 years with a bunch of people that are being attacked by a bunch of villagers around them and they can't even defend themselves. He's under the protection of the Persian Empire. But what does he say? Here I am, Lord, send me. I love recognizing the character. Like, Nehemiah is just a name, right? Like, Nehemiah. You know, some people are named that, right? Nehemiah. It's a good name. Good, good biblical name. But when you really look at his character, you're like, no, this is good. What he's doing is good. He is just putting it out there. So he's willing to move from the greatest city on earth at that time to a little outpost that's broken down, beaten up, dusty, 
and under attack. He's willing to sacrifice his own comfort, his own position, in order to serve the Lord. In this way, he was like a Christ figure in several ways. And in the Old Testament, a lot of times when you look at some of the characters, you're like, oh, that's a character of Christ, that's a character of Christ, that's a character. Because we can look back and see. But God did this back then so the Jews would recognize when Christ came that he fulfilled all those characteristics. But what did Nehemiah do? He left a highly exalted position. What did Jesus do? He came from heaven to earth. No, you're right. I mean, he, he humbled himself. He wasn't born in Jerusalem, not in Rome. He was born in Nazareth, a despised place. He left a highly exalted position to identify with God's people, to go be a part of God's people in suffering. What did Jesus do? He came and he dwelt among men. And what did he want to do? He wanted to better their position. He wanted to what? Restore them. And that's exactly what Jesus wanted to do. And if you look at the life of Nehemiah, 10 prayers in these 13 chapters, you look at the life of Jesus, he always snuck away into prayer. What does prayer show? Prayer shows a dependence upon God's power, not on your own. If you don't pray, you're really telling God, I got this. You know, we're Christians. We don't say, hold my beer. I got this. We say, hold my Bible. I got this, right? <laughs> you know, but, but we think we have it. But prayer says, no. No, we don't have this. And sometimes I get overwhelmed as a pastor of a medium-sized church in Corpus Christi because I think I got it, and then I got to get back to God and say, I don't got this. I'm not smart enough. You and your degrees. No, they don't matter. I need the Lord. I need his strength, a dependence on, upon God. If Jesus needed it as he walked as a man, God in the flesh, he needed it as he walked as a man. He needed to pray. Do I need to pray? Yeah, absolutely. So both have a prayerful dependence upon the Father. So are you willing to be the answer to your own prayers? It's a good question, right? Praying for your family members, praying for your neighbors, praying for that problem of people not visiting the convalescent homes, praying for the homeless, praying for the mission field, whatever it might be. It doesn't mean that you're going to run after all these things. I pray for a lot of things that I can't do. I don't think I'll end up doing. But I'm still always willing, Lord, what do you want with me? Where do you want to send me? So Nehemiah was willing, and God wants you to be willing, just to be willing. And when you're willing, exciting things happen. But remember, when you delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you the desires of your heart. Over the years, I've, you know, if you live in Corpus Christi, there's either Corpus haters or Corpus lovers, <laughs> right? <laughs> Nobody's really neutral on Corpus, right? And I love Corpus Christi. Are the beaches as beautiful as the beaches I've seen as I traveled all over the world on the four different continents? Nope, not even close. Are the waves as good? Well, what waves, right? What about the weather? Is the weather like, you know, Orange County, San Clemente when I lived there, or San Luis Obispo when I lived there in California? No, not at all. But I decided to delight myself in the Lord, and he led me to a place, and he gave me a love for that place. So could I, live, could I love living someplace in Kansas? If God called me there, he knows I never had enough faith to do that. But, <laughs> you know, those are the real faithful. But I'm good with God wherever he wants to send me. You know, we have the Andruses, the family that we sent out to um, Kenya two years ago. Mombasa, Kenya, where life is cheap. They see people killed often. And they deal with just radical, vicious violence and just absolute disrespect for women and rape and molestation, just craziness. And they just love it there. 
know, we got this family that just came back from Brazil, nine kids, and they've been in Brazil for 13 years. And it doesn't look like they're going to be able to go back to Brazil. One of their children has a pretty severe uh, problem, medical problem, and then um, COVID is really bad right there, right, right now. And uh, the place they're living might be sold. And so they're going, oh, we might not be able to go back. You know, and these are, these are kids raised by Americans, but they were in Brazil, and they were serving the Lord with their parents in Brazil. And they told them the other day, we probably aren't going to be going back to Brazil anytime soon. And the kids have been living on the coast in Florida, and the kids bawled their eyes out. Because God gave them a love for these people in Brazil. You know, they're considering moving here and moving on to the west side to start a ministry on the west side. So my wife and I went down and took the pictures of the, of the places that they, you know, they, they might want to purchase down there. And, and they're, you know, I, we're kind of watching our backs like, this is a little scary here, <laughs> you know. And she showed them pictures like, oh, that's so exciting. They were so excited because it reminded them of Brazil. And I, I just know, if God had called me to the west side, God would have prepared me to love the west side. Right? That's how he works, right? It would have been, oh, these people are so awesome. They come out of their houses. They love on each other. It's family. It's, and there's needs here that God can use, you know, whatever. But, right? Are you willing to be the answer to your own prayers? And then the other half of that, I always tell people, pray big prayers. Don't just pray small prayers. Small prayers are good, important. But pray big prayers. Why? You're praying to a big God. We were praying for revival. It is amazing what this COVID thing has brought as far as the spiritual health in Corpus Christi, as far as the, the, the Christians and the pastors coming together. There's so many pastors that didn't know each other, Weren't, weren't united, weren't praying for one another, and we are praying for each other all the time. Not a day goes by that I don't get probably a dozen texts or group me messages or whatever from pastors in town and pastors across the country. God's doing something, you know, and, and it isn't our end times belief that is holding us together. It isn't our particular view on the gifts that is holding us together or dividing us. It's a unity in the Lord Jesus Christ. God's doing something. You know, we've been praying for revival. And so if it starts to look like it's gelling, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to jump in because I want to be a part of it. We've been praying for it. Let's be a part of it, right? Let's pray for those big things. I always tell people, as far as the, the United States, Corpus Christi is kind of like Nazareth, right? It's like no one really knows about it. It's just this place on... I, I love Corpus, don't get me wrong, but it's just this place on the edge of the earth that people like, I think Farrah Fawcett was from that place, right? And, you know, a couple other people. Lou Diamond Phillips was from Flower Bluff. The Flower Bluff has in Corpus, right? Just kidding. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, so, yeah, God use us. Let's pray, pray big prayers. But maybe God in my family helped me to be key. And then say, here I am, use me. Lord, in my friend's marriage, I don't want to approach that. Oh, scary. But start praying for it and see what God would do. Maybe you can take them through a book of discipleship that they wouldn't come near to a church for. They're your friend. God can do it. And so Nehemiah is just this huge book that just gives us so many principles about rebuilding, about planning, about laying things out, and about trusting in a big God. And there's a huge party at the end of it, and I love it. <laughs> so let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you once again for your word, and we thank you for characters like Nehemiah, Lord, that have gone before us, Lord. We are surrounded by those that live by faith, Lord. You gave us a crowd of witnesses that we may walk in faith. Lord, just knowing that the things we face might be unique, they might be unprecedented in their specifics, Lord, but in their scope, ultimately, your people have gone through so many things, and by faith, 
have overcome. And Lord, we never see a place where you reject the faithful God. We never see it in the scriptures, and I don't think we ever experience it. Because you are always faithful. We love you, Lord. We pray for Calvary Chapel of the Coastlands through this COVID time. We pray blessings on our church. We pray that it wouldn't be spread through our church. We thank you for the fellowship, Lord. We thank you that we live in such a time that we can. It's not being together, but it's still something, Lord, where we can meet online. We can meet over services live in our homes. Lord, we are thankful for that, but Lord, we still do pray for an end to this, God. We pray for the racial tension in our nation, Lord. And Lord, if we're in here and we're white, middle-class Americans, Lord, here we are, send us. Whatever we are in this room, God, send us. Because, God, what matters is your presence not our talents, our position, or our power. It's your presence that makes a difference, God. So send us into whatever it is, God. Lord, we pray for the lost. We pray for the radically lost. We pray for those that would identify as Marxists, God. We pray for their salvation. We pray for the rioters. We pray for their salvation. They were made in your image for you to enjoy and for them to enjoy you, and they are not doing that. And we just pray for their salvation, God. We pray for those that are in the radical identity movement, loss of identity movement, God. And for those lost to their sexual sin, Lord, and transgenderism and homosexuality and I can't even go through the list of the craziness that's out there, God. We don't hate, we love. Because they are not in a place to even begin to experience your love. So I pray that they come to know you and you can sort out their lives for them, God. And Lord, if it be that you send me, send me. Or anybody else in this congregation, Lord. For those that are in drug dens right now, God, we just pray for them, that you reach them. You're a big God. We can pray big prayers. And we're nothing without your power, but you so desire to use your power in us that we say, here we are, send us, God. Be with us the rest of this week. May we have a sweet time of fellowship this weekend, on the work day and on Sunday, God. And we just pray again that those that are online and need to be at home, God, that you just continue to, to bless them in that, give them the endurance to make it through. But we do, again, just pray for that day that we can all meet together once again without any fear. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's close with a song. Mm -hmm.